Welcome back to another episode of The Lost. Today, we're covering scorpions. We are. We are absolutely covered. This is potentially one of the longer episodes we're going to do ever. <laughs> because he's in every fucking game. Well, barring free vanilla. Yeah, but... I mean, we're still going to talk about a story in 3, because he's in all the other versions. <laughs> Is this true enough? So, you know the drill. I'm Shad. He's Razor. This is The Lost. To any of our new listeners, which at this point, there certainly might be a few, I bid you hello. The Lost is partially sponsored by Test Your Might, a bunch of awesome people on the interwebs who... Uh, Concentrate heavily on the gameplay side of things, but nevertheless, they're kind enough, or at least like Icaryptus is, to put up little editorials and host our stuff over on their website. And so, very mm -hmm. grateful for that, even if he does trash talk us every now and then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A little shade may have been thrown in recent days. Don't know what we did to him. <laughs> I know I did nothing. Can't speak to you. I, I wrong people all the time. And I don't even know. So. <laughs> oh, can you believe it, man? In less than, Jesus, a little bit over half a month, you, me, and BC are going to be, like, sharing a hotel, possibly room or two, and getting to witness the grand premiere of MK11. And in just over half a month, two of the three of us will probably be dead. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. Bring a knife. I, I do suspect Cyborg will try to knife me in my sleep. It's the only way he'll be free. <laughs> it's a shame Temp can't be here for this, because I feel like if there was any one person out of the four of us that would prevent ritual murder from occurring, it would be him. It's a shame Temp can't be there, just because it means no one from the Warrior Shrine will be there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe some <laughs> fine coverage. No actual members of the Warrior Shrine will be in attendance. <laughs> That's unfortunate. <laughs> well, what can you do? I can only assume that the first episode of the Warrior Shrine, after the demo and the presentation, is going to be just an hour and a half of recorded tumbleweed sound effects. But we'll see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. We kid. We love yous. I know what we can do. What's that? We could talk about Scorpion. <laughs> we could. Because when we say welcome, I want you to imagine that you've just been transported to a rickety wooden bridge in a cave somewhere. Which may or may not be hell. And surprise, we were behind you. Welcome. <laughs> and then the donkey punch to the face. Mm, yeah. Yuck, yuck. So, uh... We have so much to cover. We really do. He's the, he's the fucking mascot. <laughs> I know a lot of you guys up there have been waiting for this. Yeah. He's in everything. You know, Scorpion is one of my favorite characters. Like, it's it feels like I'm a dirty casual when I say that. Like like what kind of person's favorite Scorpion? Or Sub Zero. You know, those are the those are the guys that the people who don't play the game recognize. Well, everyone wants to appear like they're underground, but just because something is pop doesn't necessarily yeah, no, make it's, it bad. It's a hipster thing. Yeah. And I, that's the problem. But I mean, fuck that. Like what you want to like. The I've always loved the guy. is just that, like, look, Scorpion and Sub-Zero do have the best storyline. This is they the truth. <laughs> I would... I would have debated that about Scorpion for a little while there until... Well, we'll get there. Yeah. Because I started out really, really liking him a lot. One of my favorite characters. Then he just kind of got boring and stale for a little while. But they managed to really make him interesting once more, I found. I've always found that, like... There's this back and forth with Scorpion, where his status quo keeps changing and then reverting and then changing and then reverting. And I really, I know exactly what you're talking about, and I hope that for all that is holy, they don't go that route in Eleven of making uh, the blood feud a thing again. I, I like to think that they're over that. I, I really hope so. I have, I have concerns, which we will get to when we get to MKX, but let's start at the beginning, as you do. Once upon a time, there was a man named Johnny Blaze. <laughs> and then there was a man named Al Wilson. Simmons. Al Simmons? Okay. Uh, Al Simmons yes. is Spawn. 
Al yes. Simmons. Yes. Al Simmons is Spawn. You go from Ghost Rider to Spawn. You throw in a little bit of G.I. Joe. And you're covered in Scorpions. Of, uh, 80s and 90s Kung Fu B movies in general. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A little and bit of Storm Hanzo Shadow. Kazashi. Yep. <laughs> so, I mean, we could start with MK1, but... Story-wise, Mythologies does come first. I kind of feel that we have to, in order to actually set this up properly, we should cover his brief appearances in Mythologies, first and foremost. Right, right. so uh, the interesting thing about Mythologies that not a lot of people know is that it has the most dense amount of story in any game that was released in the 90s. And the problem with that is this text isn't actually in the game. It's in the game's instruction booklet, and then there's an even longer version of it that was on the game's website, and you can only get to the website through the Wayback Machine now, the web archive. I should really go and, like, archive that page for my own personal use in case, like, the yeah, Wayback Machine I have, goes down. I have all that text saved on my hard drive just in case it ever disappears. Good stuff. But, but uh, what Mythologies gave us was the backstories to the Lin Kuei and the Shirai Ryu ninja clans. So, obviously the Lin Kuei came first, and they're not technically ninjas because they're located in China. They are a clan of assassins. They accept money from rich people, and in exchange they steal something or kill somebody, whatever they were hired to do. Did they specify at that time, or was it later uh, clarified that they stole babies during the night to make them... Uh... Uh, it was in that as well, okay. that the Lin Kuei, their specialty is having members who have superhuman powers. And the most often way they find these people is by... They'll locate someone out in the world who has powers, and those powers are usually passed on to their children. So they'll kidnap the kids... And then they have, like, somebody young and impressionable to indoctrinate into the ways of the clan. I believe that they also made mention of also using scrolls and magic sources derived from Outworld. True? Uh, it's been a while. Maybe? I don't remember that exactly. What I remember specifically is that in mythologies it said that the Lin Kuei's magic is usually uh, genetically inherited. That every member who has powers is special because of their powers. Mm. That you can't just teach these to everybody but they did have some teachable uh magic and techniques because what happened is so back in the feudal era the 1400s or so uh there was a member of the lin kuei who was from japan and his name was takeda i still wonder if kenshi's son is named that on purpose or if it's a weird coincidence i tend to think it's in pr it's on purpose i'm pretty sure that one of the reasons that they don't like officially put out their own kind of lore bible is that they have a lot like secretly written down and they have in-depth notes about who comes from what and what goes where mm. that doesn't mean that they don't retcon things when they need to but i hope so but i kind of doubt it i get this feeling they're making it up as they go yeah that's a bit pessimistic i think they, they've given me a reason to be a pessimist in a couple past games but we'll get there so so the original takeda was a member of the Lin Kuei, but he was born in Japan. So at some point in time, he quit the Lin Kuei and moved back to his home country, and he started uh, selling his talents for his own profit, like the local shoguns would hire him to assassinate or to train their troops. And so he took uh, the fighting style the Lin Kuei had taught him, and he started selling it as though he had invented it, calling it ninjutsu. So... Takeda is the inventor of ninjutsu, but ninjutsu is ripped off from the Lin Kuei. And of course, the Lin Kuei were not particularly happy about yes. this. Yes, and eventually Takeda even started his own clan, and that's the Shirai Ryu. So ever since, the Lin Kuei have hated ninjas, especially the Shirai Ryu, and this is also the reason that leaving the clan is now punishable by death. It was specified in Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance during the Conquest mode that the Lin Kuei eventually did catch up to Takeda, and they poisoned his tea. And that's how he died. I think that's in Mythologies, too. Is it? Yeah. All right. Yes, yeah, so uh, Takeda was eventually assassinated, poisoned in tea. Anyway, cut to the present day. The Shirai Ryu are still around, and one of their best fighters is Hanzo Hazashi, who is called Scorpion because his specialty is the throwing 
guard the kunai, which is kind of like, metaphorically speaking, a scorpion stinger tail. I believe historically the kunai were oftentimes coated in poison as well. Probably. They are assassins. Ninjas use poison. The My point in bringing that up is to establish that in the old timeline, he was always called Scorpion. That is his clan-given ninja code name, because ninjas don't use the real name because if it got out, who killed the guy? It's not very good assassin work, is it? You, you want to keep your identity a secret. One would hope, <laughs> yes. You don't want people hunting you down because they know you murdered this governor or politician or rich dude, whatever you did. So ninjas use code names. That's why he's called Scorpion. That's why Sub-Zero's called Sub-Zero and Smoke's called Smoke. The, it's like a superhero thing. They need to protect their secret identity. Because the job they do would have people hunting for them. Obviously. So I actually kind of wonder if the same thing applies to people who come from Edenia or Rain's name is actually Rain. Rain's name could actually be Rain. I mean, there are people named Rain... Rain is one of those words that parents think sounds pretty, so they give it to someone as a name. Well, assuming that uh, their daddy <clears throat> named Taven and Dagon, he sure didn't name Rain. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that Argus had a lot of hand in um, <laughs> Rain's upbringing, considering he's a bastard child. Yes. But anyway, Scorpion. We named him um, that because he was found in a storm, abandoned. Right. <laughs> across the street from a church in a dumpster. Sorry. <laughs> So anyway, Scorpion, like I said, the Shirai Ryu, they don't have superpowers like the Lin Kuei do. Takeda did have some uh, learnable magics to teach his ninja clans. Probably stuff like, you know, disappearing in a puff of smoke. The traditional yeah. assassin elements. Yes, the, uh, the generic ninja magics you might imagine from various video games and cartoons and anime and whatnot. Disappearing, leaving a trail of afterimages in place. You kind of get that with the teleport uh, punch. Right, but but nothing compared to cryomancy or teleportation for real, yes. like the Lin Kuei can do. Their, their genetic gifts, their mutant superpowers. That's, that's really what I'm trying to get across here, is John Tobias thought of the, the world of Mortal Kombat as having mutants in it, and some of the Lin Kuei have these X-Men powers. But the Shirai Ryu are all normal human beings. So, come mythologies, uh, two years before MK1, Scorpion is hired, because he's the best fighter in the clan, to steal a map from the Shaolin Temple by Quan Chi. Not coincidentally, a certain blue ninja has been hired to do the same thing. Because Quan Chi wanted insurance. He wanted to make sure the map gets stolen, so he hired two different people to do it. These days, yeah, it's kind of uh, implied that he actually always set things up for one or the other one of them to die, or both of them eventually, to have his own personal assassins. You don't hire rivals and not know that they're rivals. Yeah. Like, he wanted these two to fight, and he knew Scorpion was going to lose the fight because one of them has powers and the other guy doesn't. <laughs> Eh, it's a bit of a simplification. They're both really plainly incredibly skilled martial artists. It's just that one guy freezes stuff. That's it. That says a yeah, lot. Yeah, but the freezing stuff is really, really good. Yes. <laughs> so Sub-Zero and Scorpion fight, and at the end of the fight, Scorpion is beaten, and he drops to his knees, and he actually begs for mercy. Yep. And the thing about Sub-Zero, B-Han, that you need to know, is this guy is a veteran of the assassin game. Yeah. He is a firm believer in, if I don't kill my enemies, they'll kill me. Like, he's kind of paranoid, and he's really jaded, and that's sort of his whole personality, so he shows no mercy, and he rips Scorpion's spine out. <laughs> well, head and spine. He, he does his finishing move. This is the canonical time where this actually did happen. Yes. Now, in mythologies, you don't have to do it. It's right, you are given the finish him prompt, and you can actually not do the spine rip if you don't want to, and it will change a cutscene later in the game. But canonically, this is where Scorpion dies. Yes. So Hanzo goes to hell, and when he gets there, he finds out that his wife, and his kid, and his whole clan are also dead now. And what he's told is that the Lin Kuei did it. The 
the truth is that Quan Chi did it because that was the payment to the Lin Kuei for stealing the map. He told them, you give me the map and I'll kill your enemies for you. But he tells Scorpion that Sub-Zero and the Lin Kuei did it. And you see this, I believe, in mythologies in a cutscene where, like, the elder grandmaster of the Lin Kuei has presented the bones of his rivals, and he's all overjoyed, and he's the rivalry's finally done, we're the winners, ha ha ha. Yeah, and, and Sub-Zero's in the room, and he's too busy being mad at Quan Chi for hiring a second guy. Yep. But it was insurance, I just wanted to be safe. Yeah. yeah, well, it doesn't help that Quan Chi keeps calling Sub-Zero Ninja, and he hates that. It's, it's actually an insult. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I'm not a ninja. Those guys are the ninjas, and that's why we hate them. <laughs> Things that some of us lunatics cough myself. I recognize that there's a term for MK ninjas, but in-universe, the only real one is Scorpion. Right, but in Bihan's mind, the word ninja basically means rip-off. Yep. <laughs> it it means you're, like, second rate. He's a firm believer in that doctrine he is. A ninja is a cheap copy of a Lin Kuei, in his <laughs> mind. And Quan Chi keeps calling him ninja the whole game, and, like, with a smug grin on his face every time, because he knows Bihan hates him. And he really <laughs> emphasizes it, ninja, over and over again. I wonder if that was also the staff trying to get people to avoid calling them ninjas. <laughs> to try to maybe blur the lines a little bit and not have such a clear-cut depiction of a group of palette swaps, you know? Well, Tobias always knew what he was doing, because if you read uh, Sub-Zero's MK1 bio, it doesn't call them ninjas. Mm -hmm. It says Chinese assassins. It might say ninja-like assassins, but he always specified they're from China, so they're not ninjas. At this point, though, it's like talking about Shoto's. Except this is in terms yeah. of aesthetics and not in terms of gameplay so much. Right, right. Because, like, you know, Rain and Reptile are from an alien planet. But they're ninjas, too. <laughs> they're all just really, really good at martial arts. Just leave it at that. And they have similar tastes and aesthetics. I mean, they, they are all assassins by trade. Sure. You can group them together like that. But then you get into, like, the side characters, like, the side groups like what do you call the female assassins or you know the I mean, they get into well, cyber ninjas Kitana's a ninja too <laughs> everyone's a ninja but anyway yes so if you did kill scorpion as a gameplay thing in mythologies then later in the game sub-zero ends up in the prison in the nether realm and if you killed scorpion you're put in the same cell hanzo's in and he pops up and he's like you killed me in cold blood and at this point, he's wearing the outfit that we would pretty much come to associate with him strongly. The kind of ultimate yeah, MK3 the ultimate look. MK3 outfit, although he has the MK2 mask on, just like in the MK in the MK11 trailer. That's like, actually, the MK11 trailer is the first time that we've actually seen that specific combination for quite some time, I believe. But anyway, uh, so he's like, you killed me in cold blood, and then, and then he says... You also killed my wife and son and my clan. And Sub-Zero's like, no, I didn't. And Scorpion's just like, liar! And he fights him. Now, at the same time, I do remember that there's a bit of consternation about whether or not their fight in the Netherrealm is actually canon or not. Because when the MK1 and 2 comics were canon, I believe the first time that Sub ever sees Scorpion is that he finds him on the boat and he's like, impossible, you're dead, and such and such, on the way to the tournament. I mean, that, it still works because this fight is taking place in the Nether Realm. Sub-Zero should not be surprised to see a dead man there. That's fair. But, as I recall it, the scene that you see if you spare him, or he's just talking yeah, to Shinnok... It... If you let him live, then when you're thrown in the cell, Shinnok is your cellmate. And he, he, you don't know he's Shinnok, or at least Bihan doesn't know. And he acts very kindly and like a, a nice old man. And he's just kind of says this cryptic stuff about how he's, he's only in this cell until he's done playing Raiden's game. And then he like mysteriously disappears. And I actually like that scene better of the two. For me, it just makes a lot more sense that if 
if you if you did want to keep the MK1 comic as your personal canon, it makes just a lot more sense to me for Sub Zero's surprise and his shock to see him for the first time on the boat again after so long. But it does it does work either way. The other thing worth mentioning is okay, so the first time you fought Scorpion in the Shaolin Temple, when he was still alive, he didn't have any special moves. And when you fight him the second time in the Nether Realm, he has the spear. And he has his ultimate MK3 axe combos, and I think he has the teleport punch, but I don't remember for sure. Pretty sure he does. He might already have his specter powers at that point then. I'm I'm You could read it either way. I'm pretty sure that he does. Like at this point he's already been convinced of the family and clan's death and Behan's culpability in it. So I tend to think that yes, by this by this point in time, the webs have been weaved and the lies have been told. I mean, I mean, the thing of it that is, I guess, weird for me is that the spear was something he could do when he was alive. It didn't come out of the palm of his hand like it does now. That's a supernatural thing that happened to him when he died. But it's just weird that he couldn't throw the spear when he was alive because that's where his name comes from. Maybe they just really wanted to be certain that the player was going to win that first quote-unquote boss fight. I guess. But I just take it as for granted that he that he always could. Like I was saying earlier, whenever he te- whenever he does a teleport punch, like he leaves an afterimage behind, and that's like a very typical ninja thing to do. Well, it's it. You could read it as like a ninja trick. I always read it as like a ghost thing. I think it can be both. And then, of course, later games have added fire to the teleport punch. Yeah, they've added fire to a lot of things. Most things. I'm okay with that. We'll get there. It's an issue right. that I have. I think I've mentioned this okay. to you before. But, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, p- particularly about Scorpion, uh, his modus operandi being throwing a rope dart, is that the name is actually the name of a Japanese martial art that focuses on thrown weapons, like shurikens and darts. So that's where Tobias got the name of the clan from. Well, shiver me timbers and blow me down. Learn something new every day with you, man. I mean, it's it's hard to find that information now, because if you Google Shirai Ryu, you're mostly only going to get Mortal Kombat pages. But if you had searched for it back in the late 90s, you would find out that it was the name of a martial art. Ah... <laughs> <laughs> uh... So, once you beat Scorpion in that prison, assuming you do confront him, he just sort of disappears in a puff of smoke and fire, and that's the last and you see of him. And then mysteriously, the d- door to your jail cell opens, and you get to run out into the rest of the level. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> and, just a brief note here about that particular fight. It is, like, the only time you ever have, like, a specific fight theme, I think. For Scorpion and Sub Zero in the entire original timeline, and it's hmm. really, really badass. <laughs> like I put the Mortal Kombat mythologies uh, score up in my top ten MK scores of all time. It's pretty dated at this point. It's a kind of like a homebrewed synth sound that I pretty attached to. But yeah, yeah, it's it's very like um, sort of unobtrusive industrial. Yes. <laughs> This might be why I like it. I mean, the game came out in 1997. It was Nine the right Nails time. Was yes. Rammstein was a thing. <laughs> there, that was sort of the vibe <laughs> of the day. So, yeah. And Mythologies is a very sort of industrial gothic game. Very true. Because it, it deals with uh, the Nether Realm. And John Tobias's particular vision for the Nether Realm was very mechanical. It. He, had, he has this whole story going on about how Shinnok wants the Earth so bad that he's trying to make Netherrealm look more like Earth. So there's a lot of uh, machinery. It's very, like, factory and warehouse-themed. It's all very kind it's of... It's very Doom. Smoggy and... There's spotlights and searchlights and guards with laser cannons. And I actually... I've said this before, I think. I, I really miss that version of the Netherrealm. And I yeah, hope to see I... it again sometime, but... I mean, what we know that there are multiple planes to the Nether Realm, and that we see the fifth the most often, and the fifth is based on the Scorpion's Hell stage from Ultimate MK3. Yeah. 
But I like to imagine that the prison still exists on, like, the first layer where you can see the sky. Yeah, me too. I just kind of hope to see hints of it and going back as far as Deception, and it's never popped up. It would be nice. There were there were touches of the, like, the sci-fi tech aesthetic in Shinnok's Tower in Armageddon Conquest. Mm. Yes, I, I like remember that. that now. But it would it would be nice to see, like, the prison again. I'm sure we will one of these days. If it's the stage, if not the entire background and industrial hellscape. Yeah. Anyway, so so that's pretty much the end of Scorpion and Mythologies. Uh, cut to two years later, the first actual game, Mortal Kombat 1. And so Mythologies was the game that named him Hanzo Hazashi and named his clan the Shirai Ryu and told us how he died and all of that. In MK1, all we really knew was that he's a ninja, he's from a clan that are rivals to the Lin Kuei, and Sub-Zero killed him. We didn't even know that his wife and kid were dead yet at this point in time. His ending actually kind of implies they're still alive, but he can never see them again because he's a zombie guy now. Yeah, they hadn't specified them particularly as being dead just yet. Yeah. That would come with time. That, that was all introduced in mythologies. But... In MK1, we get a guy who's basically out to avenge his own death. And a lot of the um, adaptation material tended to say that the reason that his death was so important that it was worth coming back for avenging is that he died dishonorably. Which is... It's a very, like, Viking-slash-samurai way of looking at the afterlife. That, like, you get the good heaven if you die with honor, and you go to hell if you die with dishonor. And in in Scorpion's case, we do kind of see that in mythology still. Like, he died on his knees begging. <laughs> it's implied, I think, that that's where most of the Shira Ryu wound up eventually, too. I mean, from what we understand now of um, the afterlife in Mortal Kombat, it's very much good people in heaven, yeah. bad people in hell. And the Shirai Ryu are assassins. You know, they kill people for money. They're bad people. And there is there is actually a little bit of backstory from Mythologies that I kind of skipped over, is that Scorpion, the way he joined the clan, is that his dad was a Shirai Ryu ninja. Uh, and this is like a parallel to uh, Sub-Zero's backstory, where uh, Bihan and Kwai Liang's dad was also a Lin Kuei. Except... Uh, Sub-Zero's dad sort of abducted his own kids and forced them to join the clan, like, took them away from their mother and made them join the Lin Kuei. Whereas Scorpion's dad said, I don't want this life for you. Don't become a ninja. Don't kill people. Right. It's bad. And Scorpion's whole thing is like, I have to, I have to make a living. I have to provide for my family. My wife and kids need to eat, so I'm going to be a ninja. <laughs> So it's an interesting uh, reversal where, like, the Sub-Zeros didn't want to be ninjas, and Scorpion became a ninja against his father's wishes. It's nice. They could have just as easily gone on a cycle of violence tangent where one of their dads killed the other one's dad and made it a bloodline thing, but I'm relieved that they didn't go down that path. So so what you've got is this, um, morally, uh... Bihan is a guy who was raised in this life of killers and it was forced on him and it's made him very bitter and cynical and he's sort of paranoid about his own survival and that's why he's uh, a killer. An unrepentant murderer is because he feels like he has to or else he's the one in danger. Kwai Liang, who's younger and hasn't killed as much, is very much still against killing. And so when we get to MK2 Sub-Zero doesn't want to kill people unless he has to. Scorpion is this guy who kills people, but he thinks he's doing it for a good reason. He sees himself as, like, a good man, an honorable man, and he's not, and that's why he goes to hell when he dies. Yes, he is still a murderer. But he still, he still thinks of himself as doing the best he can do. Which is not to say that, like, the series has ever particularly black and white about painting one good and another evil. It's usually kind of a gray area, except for where Kwai Liang is concerned. Yeah, yeah. I would say that, like, both Scorpion and Bi Han, 
there are there are grays there. And I, I, I guess Scorpion is the more good of the two, but he's still not he's still closer to neutral. Yeah. Behan has the capacity or he had the capacity to turn his life around at one point, but he just never So back to our boy. Right. So so Scorpion, MK1. He is uh allowed to leave the nether realm he is given his specter powers unless he already had them in mythologies and he is the game specifically refers to it as reincarnated as a specter so i find that interesting because there's especially with like the revenants and mkx there's kind of a talk about are they still undead what what is a revenant because like they have physical body. They are technically alive. And so Scorpion... Scorpion has risen from the grave in, like, a new body. It's not the one he died in. That one's probably buried somewhere. And he has superhuman powers now. His spear comes out of his hand. He can teleport. He can breathe fire, you know, peel his face off, and it's a skull. It's like a human body. It's not... It's not what the Revenants have. No, it's it's similar because it's, you know, when in MKX, when Raiden brings Sub Scorpion, Sub-Zero, and Jax back to life, the same process works on all of them, but Scorpion didn't have the pale skin and the yellow veins. He was a different kind of undead already. That's actually something that I wanted to briefly mention. If you look at the MK1 select screen... Scorpion and Sub-Zero plainly have kind of a paler shade of skin than anyone else there. And I kind of took that to mean, eventually, when I first started playing the games and I became familiar with the uh, character storylines and the lore, I took that to essentially mean that, like, Sub-Zero was the way he was because, you know, ice powers, he's a frosty guy, what have you. This, is my, this was my child interpretation of it. But Scorpion... Okay. Once, you know, it became obvious that he was dead, that's when I took his lighter, well, his paler shade of skin to actually be signifying. It, it's not that it actually matters that much, because by MK2, they had normal flesh tone, both of them. Right, well, I have to say, um, their sprite editing game was not quite what it was in MK2 in MK1, because on the select screen, Scorpion's eyes have pupils. That might have been a late choice, I tend to think. Well, if you look like... Because John Tobias was drawing him with the all-white eyes that he's famous for. In the in the official, like, the concept art and in the comic book. This is but true, like, but it might have been an oversight. In Scorpion's ending in MK1, we see him unmasked and it's just it's fucking it's, it's, Tessina. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't, like, put a beard or longer hair or anything on him. It's just... Johnny Cage in a ninja costume. It might have just been an oversight, or because of the fact that, you know, the fact that he was actually dead is not something that the player would know until they saw his ending or saw his fatality. Mm. That was probably, I think, an extra layer to the disguise at that time. And once it's like publicly accepted a known fact that this is a dead guy running around on, uh, in, on the living plane, you know, okay, take the cool points, remove the pupils, go with it. And I'm okay with that. Well, I want to I wanna bring up uh, the thought of Unmasked Scorpion just in general, because there are people who uh, think that Scorpion actually doesn't have a face when he's undead. That when he peels off the mask, it's always the skull. And the only way we were going to see his human face is if he came back to life like he does in MKX. And I don't think that's true. I think Scorpion could have chosen to leave the skin on and shown his face if he wanted to at any point in any of the games. He just chooses to peel all the way down to the skull and breathe the fire. I tend to think it's open to interpretation. I like the notion of the face being part of the mask, which is blatantly more of a reptile thing, plainly. I've always enjoyed the thought of, like, there being no substance to the body, as it were. He can die, mm. he can be sliced up, he can bleed, but it's all ultimately... It's a reincarnated body. 
I mean, while we're talking about that, I have to say, like, because in the games, he has organs. You can cut him, and it's red blood. I've always liked the movie version where he bleeds lava. I kind of wish that was a thing. <laughs> I don't know. That seems a bit much to me. It was it was a really, really cool when I saw it in theaters. I can't deny that. But I don't need everyone to have 20 different types of blood. You've already got the Cyber Ninjas <laughs> bleeding uh, black or spewing oil. Reptile bleeds green, canonically. I think I think they could pull it back in places like the Shokan don't need to bleed green. Like, MK3 is the only time Shiva bleeds green. Yeah. It's just, just weird. I think that was an accident. I don't know. No, I think I think it was intentional. They were, you know, they had this tech for the first time, and they were like, okay, well, who would have alien blood? Yeah. The show came, right? <laughs> but then they were like, wait, no. Both Goro and Kitaro didn't bleed that way. Yeah, they so, they, up. so they went back they on quietly it. dropped it. But um, the reason I wanted to bring up the fact that Scorpion's body is sort of the same and sort of different from the Revenants in X is because Scorpion, when he came back from the dead in X, got to keep his powers. I mean, you sort of have to do it that way for gameplay reasons. Yeah. Scorpion would be awful boring if he didn't have the teleport punch anymore. And, you know, there are animations that are the same across all variations, and you can't do anything about that. It's quite true. But... I just, I think it adds something to him if, that he got to keep his Spectre abilities when he came back from the dead completely. As though those are so much a part of him now that it doesn't matter whether he's, like, what kind of alive he is. That's just him now. Well, I, t I do still tend to think that Teleport Punch is a thing that he always could do. And... They didn't go crazy giving him a lot of, like, Hellfire summoning abilities until much, much, much later on. From MK4 forward, it was just, like, him breathing fire, and that was it. And I'm not going to get into the giant scorpion thing, because that was dumb and made no sense. <laughs> I kind of like the animality in 4. But... But no. Why? Why would you? I just... I, I, I can't do it, it was... man. I can't. Look, I'm okay with animalities if the animal makes sense. That's all I'm saying. If there has and to be a spiritual there, reason. No for animal it. will ever make sense. But scorpion a scorpion, sure. <laughs> I I can't do it, man. There's like you specified, I, fine. there's a we thematic don't, we don't ever have to see it again. There's a thematic reason he's named that. It's not meant to be taken literally. Right. Right. And there are costumes that take it too literally, and I have a problem with those, so I definitely see where you're coming from. Yeah, nine sucks, you know. I'm just saying, like, fatalities aren't always canon, so... <laughs> no, no. If that were true, you know, that would imply that Liu Kang trained to focus on an arcade machine or three and drop them. <laughs> yeah, Liu Kang knows he's in a video game and is able to summon it from the fourth wall. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so back to the story of MK1. Yeah, we are almost 45 minutes into this, and we haven't touched MK1. <laughs> Consider that. You knew it would be a two-parter. Oh, I am i don't know, man. I think we might be able to squeeze three out of this, but we'll see. <laughs> so, so at MK1, uh, starting with the canon comic book by Tobias, uh, Scorpion and Sub-Zero encounter each other for the first time since the Netherrealm on the boat to the island. Sub-Zero is uh, spending the whole boat ride just sort of sitting on top of the cabin roof of the boat, just watching people. Sneering at them, yeah. as he does. Be being sneaky as ninjas are. And Scorpion just kind of pops up behind him, grabs him up by the neck, and says, Hey, remember me, asshole? <laughs> Impossible! You're dead! And, and so on and so forth. Yeah, he's like, yeah, I am, but I came back, and I'm gonna fuck you up. Look into but he my says, eyes. And this is, this is interesting to me. He says, he's like, I could kill you now. If you were me, I bet that's what you would do. But no, see, I have honor. I'm going to wait till the tournament, and we're going to have a fair fight, and then I'm going to get you. So, the, again, like, Hanzo swears he's an honorable man. He's like, I don't do things the way you do, you fucking killer. <laughs> I think that's it for them in the comic book. Yeah. They get uh they get to the island without further incident. And for a long, long time, 
all we knew was, well, from Sub-Zero's MK2 ending onwards in Scorpion's bio, we were led to believe initially that Scorpion had killed this guy, and then he saw him wandering around again. It was like, what? Well, no. Okay, so there's a couple layers to yeah. it. Yeah. So first of all, if you're just reading the bios and endings straight out of the game, uh, none of them actually say Scorpion is the one who killed Sub-Zero. They just say that Kwai Liang believes his brother is dead because he never came back from the tournament. So the Lin Kuei set, you know, makes him the new Sub-Zero and sends him to the next one to finish the mission of assassinating Shang Tsung for money. The only place that says Scorpion did it and that it happened for sure is the official MK2 comic book, which... Okay, so the MK1 comic book was kind of easy to find because pieces of it were in the instruction guides on the home for systems. But the MK2 comic was a lot more rare. I never actually saw a copy until, like, the mid-2000s. Yeah, I never had it either. But it does say in Scorpion's ending in 2 that he becomes his guardian to atone for murdering his older brother. Fair enough. So just, I'm getting that out there, like... Alright, because the thing is that you're not you're never actually sure with endings whether they're canon or not. But they specify facts. The events don't happen, but the things that they usually reveal about a character, you can usually True. take those as concrete information going forward. Not always. Like, the Kung Lao is his ancestor in MK9 and being a good example of them cocking that up. It happens. True. But... But... Normally, when a bio or an ending shows you something about the character, like, yeah. you know, Rain was Katana's childhood friend, Reptiles were the last of his race, you can take that. Yeah, the, the backstory parts are usually yeah. always canon. The thing is, I want to be, I want to, like, illustrate the fact that they were a little bit vague because of classic Sub-Zero being a character in Ultimate. Oh, yeah, and, and obviously we know now that that character isn't even canon, and the whole thing never really made sense. It just, it used to confuse me as a child. The matter of classic Sub-Zero is something we could probably get a good 15 minutes out of on the, I guess, beyond retrospective? I guess so. <laughs> like, to, to make a long story really short, nowadays... I just look at it as a noob running around in his old outfit for for yucks. It's not. I don't it's know. Not there, canon. there was a there was a period in my teens where I was convinced it was Johnny Cage just because that's <laughs> funny. <laughs> I remember all sorts of fucking uh, theories about that guy. He was Johnny Cage. Uh, he was actually the great Kung Lao who had learned how to use ice powers. <laughs> Shao Kahn made a clone, or Shang Tsung made a clone. All sorts of dumb, stupid shit. This classic sub was a fucking mess. Uh, but but as far as, like, going back to MK2 goes, so the reason I want to get to the comic is because, and it being the only place where we really learn how Bihan died, is because what we specifically learn in that comic is that Scorpion and Sub-Zero were both eliminated from the tournament without ever fighting each other. They never had a match. Like, they just weren't arranged on the bracket in that way. So, Scorpion's claim back on the boat of, I'm gonna get you in the tournament because I have honor, he ended up having to go against it. And so, while Liu Kang is fighting Shang Tsung at the end of the tournament, Scorpion's like, hey, Sub-Zero, you're not leaving this island alive, motherfucker. We're gonna have our fight, tournament or no tournament, and that's where he does the deed. Yeah, and it's it's during it's during all the mayhem after Goro's yeah. been beaten, where Shang has like sent the masked guards to attack everybody. It's very much like the opening cutscene of Shaolin Monks, where it's just kind of random open fighting. He's trying to just kill everybody. Nobody leaves the island alive. So Raiden can see Scorpion and Sub Zero fighting, but he can't stop them because he's taking care of the masked guards. And so, so Raiden is the only witness to Sub-Zero's death. And he tells Johnny Cage about it as he's saving him from the island collapsing. Yeah, it's basically a couple of panels full of exposition-filled dialogue. Yeah. 
But but the point is, Raiden is definitely a reliable narrator, so we do know for a fact Scorpion toasted Sub Zero and then burnt himself down to nothing, went back to the Nether Realm. Yep. So come MK2, Scorpion's chilling in the Nether Realm. This is his life now, <laughs> and he kind of hates it, as one would. I mean, it is hell. <laughs> he learns and... that Sub Zero is back. Yes, he happens to overhear, probably from Quan Chi. I was about to say. That, hey, so there's a guy calling himself Sub-Zero at this new tournament Shao Kahn's having. What's up with that, bro? <laughs> Impossible! I gotta go check this out. Wait, what are you doing with that black corpse? Nothing. On your way. Pay no attention to this. Do-do-do-do-do, <laughs> <laughs> sculpt, sculpt, mold, mold. I shall call him right. Noob Cybot, and he shall be my Cybot. Ah, <laughs> uh, Scorpion, Scorpion, Scorpion. So motivated by rage. It's a beautiful so thing. So Scorpion gets to the tournament, and he's watching Sub-Zero fight. And Sub-Zero happens to not kill a guy. And Scorpion is immediately like, Bihan would never do that. This is a different guy! <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> now, there are reasons... For it. I'll get into those more, I think, in the uh, in the Beehan episodes. But I'm pretty sure the guy that spared was Reptile. Yes, and I've always assumed it was Reptile too. And it's interesting, even in MK9, he fights Reptile before he fights Scorpion. And lets him live on purpose. And granted, in the MK9 version, Scorpion doesn't see it. And doesn't have the whole... Behan would never do that. Yeah. You're diff you know, he he somehow just automatically knows anyway. But we'll get to that. But I, I too have always assumed that it was reptile for some reason. I guess begging for your life just seems like a reptile thing. <laughs> and it was also the MK9 uh, fact that he also fights him. You know, I figure parallels, right? I suppose. I always just assumed that it would be Reptile because the reason Sub-Zero's at the tournament is to assassinate Shang, and Reptile is Shang's bodyguard. Yeah, that too. Exactly. So I imagine that before he can get to Shang, he'd have to fight Reptile. And a brief note about the way that Scorpion kills Sub-Zero, or, or kills Behan, the place where it occurs. As much as I like how MK9 builds up the hype and the drama about their final confrontation, I don't care for the fact that he brings him to hell to do it. Yeah. I always just assumed that it was somewhere on the island, like the Palace Gates or Goro's Lair. Like, I figured pretty much that. It was like the Pit or the Palace Gates, somewhere nice, open, and public, where, like, people could see yeah, shit going Yeah, I mean, we know down. Raiden was there in this version, yeah. and he was fighting masked guards and shit. Like, they were definitely on the island. So in the original timeline, he Scorpion didn't bring Sub-Zero to hell to kill him. That's an MK9 thing. Just wanted to make that little, uh differentiation. They don't actually say this, but I always assumed that in MK2, the reason Smoke is fought on Goro's lair is because he was on Shang's Island looking for proof of the death. Like, he was trying to find Bihan's body. I think that was probably what his mission was that the Lin Kuei sent him to do. Because Smoke wasn't in the tournament. That's why he's a hidden character. Well, like we were saying, when we learn things about people... The smart thing, I think, to do is to always go back and apply as much of what we know to the original timeline or older characterizations as is possible to gain new insights. And just along with Sub-Zero to find proof of his brother's death always made a lot of sense to me. So that's what I yeah. figured, too, going from that forward. There were allies. Yeah. Smoke had to be running around, like, on Shang's on for a reason. Clearly, they were both dispatched together, and MK9 did an admirable job of tying together why they would be, you know, running around together and why Smoke would maybe be around the area. Right. Because at MK9, there's no body to find, so he had to go to Outworld with him. Yeah. So, yeah, so MK2. So, uh, Scorpion witnesses Kwai Liang spare a guy, and he immediately realizes this is not the same Sub-Zero. What's going on here? Strange. Identical muscular definition. Identical in every single way, but plainly not the same dude. Yes, because Bihan would never not kill someone. <laughs> <laughs> so... I find that interesting, that, like, Scorpion knows him so well that he's like, he would never not kill someone. <laughs> it's either he knows him so well, or he just doesn't believe him capable of a single act of compassion. It's true, and, like, to be fair, that's pretty on point. 
there's only one person Bihan has ever fought in his entire life that he let live, and it's Serena, and we don't know why he did it. Shipping reasons? It might have just <laughs> been because she's hot. <laughs> I can just actually picture Raiden's head circling around him in a small orbit around his noggin. You're gonna go to hell. You're gonna go to hell. You're gonna go to hell. Okay, maybe not today. Well, he didn't He didn't find that out until after he fights Serena, though. <laughs> uh, who knows? But anyway, so, so Scorpion fights Sub-Zero in the tournament, and he wins the fight. And he decides not to kill Kwai Liang, because at this point he's kind of put two and two together, and he's figured out, or maybe he's been told, that the new Sub-Zero is Bihan's brother. And he's like, family. I had a family once. And he killed my family. So if I killed his family, that would probably be bad. <laughs> like, that would make me look like a dick. And then he starts kind of figuring out... So there's this thing with Scorpion and MK2. Where he thought that when he got his revenge... Like, that was his mission, man. Like... The guy who killed me, the guy who killed my wife and kid, the guy who killed my clan. I get that guy, and I get to rest in peace, is the exact words. Rest in peace. Which means not be a specter anymore, maybe even not be in hell anymore, maybe get, go to heaven. Because again, we're operating on uh, an older version of the canon where ninja heaven and hell, the morality is more based on honor than good and evil. Right. So, Scorpion actually thought that when he got his revenge, that would be it for this Netherrealm shit. And then in MK2, he's killed Bihan, and he's still in the Netherrealm, and he's like, what the fuck do I need to do to get out of here? So when he finds Kwai Liang, he's like, wait a minute. Maybe the problem is that I'm a sinner. I went to hell because I was bad. <laughs> Maybe I need to start doing good things. <laughs> and so he becomes... Kwai Liang's quote-unquote guardian. Yes, there's... So, what it specifically says in MK2 and in MK3 is that he's going to watch Sub-Zero's back and protect him as atonement and hope that this will eventually let him rest in peace. Like, make up for his old sins. There was, around the time of Armageddon... There was some promotional material that sort of went back through Scorpion and Sub-Zero's stories, and it was on MySpace. And it was... I know that sounds iffy, but it was run by Midway themselves, so I'm including it. And it actually kind of reworded the MK2 part to say that what he actually was trying to do was keep an eye on Kwai Liang and make sure he doesn't end up like his brother. That's a very vague and unnecessary way of rewording it. But I mean, you could say both are true, like... So what's he gonna do? Just pop up over his shoulder and go, You know, you really shouldn't be killing people. Look what happened to me! Well, that's the funny thing, because Scorpion... So when Scorpion beats Sub-Zero in the MK2 tournament and lets him live, he doesn't tell him why. We know from Sub-Zero's ending that he has no idea why Scorpion spared him. Yep. He's confused and he's like, wait... That guy killed my brother. Should I be going after him? Because he just beat me up and I don't want to die. <laughs> he doesn't know what to do. And Scorpion has told him nothing. Just disappears. He just won a match and he abandons his spot in the tournament and goes back to the nether realm. Yeah, he doesn't come up to him and go and shake, or shake his hand and, and go, you know, I'm going to watch your back, bro. Catch you later. Yeah, there's... There's no we're friends now conversation. There's no tea ceremony. He just leaves. <laughs> just kind of wanders around clueless for a little while. Right. So, so cut to MK3 and Scorpion's not in it. Cut to Ultimate MK3. And it's interesting because all the characters that weren't in MK3 and then the characters that are in Trilogy that weren't in Ultimate, every time they bring a new character onto the roster... Their bio actually includes sort of an excuse why they're late to the fighting. And in Scorpion's case, what his bio in Ultimate says is that after he returned from the tournament, he was now trapped in the Nether Realm. And maybe this is Quan Chi going, 
look, you're supposed to kill Sub-Zeros. If you're not going to do it, then I got no use for you. You're stuck down here. <laughs> Possible. Possible. Because in all the other games, Scorpion can leave any time he wants. <laughs> He's kind of broken. Like, if you kill him, he can just teleport back. See, he's basically invincible. <laughs> That's something that they kind of slowly let go. Like, they kind of became very lax in their restrictions as to who could travel where at any given time. Yeah, like, you don't you don't really realize Scorpion is this broken until Deadly Alliance. When When we were back in the 2D era, the arcade era... There was sort of a feeling that if Scorpion died during his mission, that was going to be that it. was the end. He couldn't come back and try again. But eventually, it just became portals known only to gods and sorcerers. And if he gets kicked into an acid bath, he's just going to pop up again a couple of hours later. Who yeah, fucking he can knows? just he can just teleport in and out. Even the MKX comic has him, and this is you know the living Hanzo still has the ability to go to hell and just leave. But at the time. Yes, at the time, not so much. So He was just kind of wandering around down there. He had no one to set him free or no way to get back up to, up to the top. Yeah. And to be fair, Quan Chi had not been introduced into the canon yet. Yeah. So we didn't know if Scorpion made himself a specter just by being angry enough, you know, just by being a vengeful spirit. Or if there was a specific demon he was making deals with or what. I always saw it as kind of a destiny and purpose kind of thing. That he had he had reasons to be up where he was. Yeah, just sheer force of will, which is how evil spirits usually work in things. Precisely. And otherwise, he was stuck down there. Again, this is something the MKX comic adds. It says that Quan Chi didn't make him a specter. He just recruited him after Scorpion made himself a specter. Force of will, angry spirit. Which I kind of like a little bit better. And that's probably why he got to keep his fire powers when he came back to life. Works enough well for me. Right. But anyway, Ultimate MK3, Scorpion is stuck in hell. And as we've established, he hates it down there. And he can't leave. And so there comes a point during the invasion of Earthrealm where Shao Kahn gets really greedy. And he's like, you know what? I don't just want the living population of Earthrealm. I want all the souls from Earthrealm that have died, too. And this is, this is like the only time, I think, in the entire trilogy era, or the entire three portion of the trilogy, where this is mentioned. At yeah. all. Yeah. It doesn't figure into anyone else's ending, it's not a central plot point, it is just a way for Scorpion to be present. Yeah. But this is the only time in the entire uh, history of Mortal Kombat where Khan is ballsy enough to take a poke at the Netherrealm, too. So, he tries to steal the souls of Earth's dead from Hell. And it doesn't work. What it does instead is suck Scorpion up to Earthrealm. He is inadvertently released. Just kind of... Whoop. He, uh, he hops from, he hops from uh, Scorpion's Hell stage to Khan's cave stage. <laughs> it is literally downstairs because of reasons. That's canon. I mean, I guess, I guess that uh, that graded MK logo in the floor of Khan's throne room is a portal to hell. <laughs> Maybe the grate's there to cover up what went terribly wrong. <laughs> he couldn't close it, so he's just like, just put some uh, put a put jar some bars over, over it. it so I can walk there. <laughs> put a lid on it. It'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Smooth out the walls and they can't crawl out. We're good. So Shao Kahn has accidentally summoned Scorpion. And... He's like, you know what, I can work with this. You're a good fighter. If you join my side, there's an interesting thing about this whole merger business. While the merger is going on, anybody who dies doesn't go to heaven or hell. So, as long as you're working for me, you can't be sent back to the nether realm. How about it? This is uh, <laughs> specified directly in Johnny Cage's trilogy bio. It's, like he's just kind it's of, in both of them. Yeah. It's in Scorpions, and then it comes back in Johnny... And it's how they bring Johnny Cage back to life. Precisely. So it is oddly consistent. They had a plan. Sort of. Yeah. I mean, sometimes their reasons are a little bit shoehorned in. Like this invasion of hell that went nowhere, but... Yeah. So Scorpion, for the first time in three games, does something genuinely evil and works for Shao Kahn for a bit. Because he doesn't want to go back to hell. 
And then he finds out that Kwai Liang is on the other side. Well, he's one of Raiden's chosen warriors. Deals off. Yeah, yeah. He's like, you know what? I, got, I made a vow, and I'm a man of honor. Vows are important to me. I'm supposed to protect that guy. So I'll see you later. <laughs> and yeah, that's basically all there is to Scorpion being around in part three. Yeah, he, he switches sides, and he apparently actually fights alongside Kwai Liang. Like, I have to imagine that at this point, they finally have a fucking conversation. Whatever, whatever it is that happens, maybe, maybe it's while Sub-Zero is fighting the Cyber Ninjas. Scorpion shows up to help fight it with him. This is conjecture, him. but it's nice conjecture. I mean, we, we have to assume he does, because he says he's gonna. Like, the reason he quits Shao Kahn's army is to protect Sub-Zero. So he must actually do some protecting of Sub-Zero at some point. It depends... I don't know. It probably depends largely on how much of Smoke's ending is canon. It is possible that, that Smoke turned like, that smoke turned on them and helped Sub-Zero instead. Yeah. Well, I mean, I imagine they both fight with him. Because I've always imagined that Smoke does regain his memories and switch sides. And then while he's fighting Shao Kahn's forces with Sub-Zero, he gets deactivated and captured. And Sub-Zero assumes that he's dead because... Robot deactivation is pretty much death. It's hilarious just how much of MK3 that they expanded on in Deadly Alliance, and there's still so many layers that they could never quite go into. A lot of yeah, stuff it's... happens in MK3. See, this, we'll is my, this is my big disappointment with 9, is that there are so many things in 3 that were told about in vague terms that would be amazing if we actually got to see them. And none of them happen in 9. And it's just the biggest missed opportunity there could possibly be. But yeah, I have to assume that Scorpion and Sub-Zero do fight back-to-back -back at some point before the invasion's over. It's a nice thought, but I tend to be very literal at interpreting dialogue. I've never had the notion or the mental image of them fighting together, but it's not impossible. What we do know, know that's, is that... That's the way I've always pictured it, because at this point, I'm just like, just let them be on the same side. They've been building to it. That's the whole point of the vow of protection thing, is to finally turn these guys from enemies to friends. It's not impossible. I figure that if that had actually happened, they would have made reference to it further down the line. I don't know, that's, that's a switch from Tobias de Vogel thing. Well, anyway, one way or another, he doesn't actually keep fighting for Khan. Either he helps Sub-Zero, or he just stops fighting for Khan, and he fucks off back down to the pits of hell. That's it. What, whatever done. it is that happens, after the invasion is over, he's back in the nether realm. Briefly, I want to touch on his ultimate MK3 fatality. Okay. Now, w this would be the one where he summons a whole bunch of other scorpions to jump you, yes, and the lights go out? Correct. For ages, I had no fucking idea what they were trying to do with that. I, yeah, I didn't. it took me until adulthood to consider that maybe those other Scorpions are just supposed to be Shirai Ryu guys. I might have been the one that actually told you about that. I don't know. It's possible. But yeah, it was a revelation I had when, like, replaying Ultimate years and years later on the Game Boy Advance. And I'm like, fuck! Those are the dead members of his clan! They just reused his sprite over and over again because reasons, you know? Simplest thing. Yeah. At the time, I just thought it was really, really stupid, and I was being... I mean, I was a kid. I was really literal about these things. After I saw Classic Sub, it took me about a month to figure, oh, okay, what they're actually doing when the screen fades out is his classic head and spinal cord rip. See, I was so literal I knew, about like the I knew direction. That was the spine rip because because uh, strategy guides called it the spine rip, but none of the strategy guides ever like that was sort of how I would put two and two together when I didn't know what a mover fatality was going for. Was what did they call it in the strategy guides? I saw it addressed as the face rip in some issue of either Tips and Tricks or video game, and I just hmm. didn't put it together because some dipshit misled me for like a month. Yeah, and it's embarrassing in retrospect, because his fist is roughly at face level when he does it, but yeah. it's it's obvious painfully so now what it's supposed to be. Anyhow, I just thought I'd throw that little bit of a personal yeah. trivia. Yeah, in. but but I never I never put together that those were like the dead members of his clan because if they had named it something that alludes to that in a strategy guide, I would have gotten it. But I always just thought it was weird that he's summoning a whole bunch of himself. Yeah, 
It was it wouldn't be until Mythologies properly came out a year and uh, about two years and some change later on that we actually got the name Shirai Ryu for the first time. That's another thing. Like during Ultimate, we didn't really know his clan was dead. This is true. Mythologies came out after Trilogy. So they were planning all of this stuff behind the scenes and just gave us this kind of info dump in Mythologies. That's why there's just so yeah. much there. They do say that every game they have so much that they want to fit in and they never actually get around to putting everything that they want to in a given game. That's always why it's been sort of a bummer to me that Mythologies is thought of as like, because the gameplay is bad, it's sort of a forgotten game. Or a derided game. It's if you're into the lore, Mythologies is actually the most important game. It's definitely up there. It's just a shame that it's so fucking tedious and terrible to play. Yeah, it is not. It is not fun to play. Times I want to go back and just replay it and remember it, and all I remember is horror and pain and frustration. The the jumps in the wind temple, the pit traps in the earth. Ugh. I, the mashers. You can't even get to the Nether Realm if you play on easy. It'll stop the game. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> Fucking pricks. Ugh. But uh, yes, MK4 rolls around. Yeah. So so in MK4, Scorpion sitting in the Nether Realm as he always does, and we finally meet Quan Chi. Well, we met him in Mythologies, and he's like, so Scorpion. You want to get out of hell, right? Okay, well, imagine this for a second. What if Bihan killed you, but Kwai Liang was the one who killed your clan, and that's why you don't have your revenge yet? You ever think about that, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> they don't specify that particular bit in his MK4 bio. He has ulterior motives. His main reason for being around is that Quan Chi offers him, like, life. If he, if, yeah, he if, says, if he joins up with him. Fight fight in Shinnok's army, and we will release you from the Nether Realm. Forever. And it's in the endings that you get the true story that he was misled to think Kwai Liang was part of his revenge. And the thing about that is that Scorpion's ending in this game is canon. Mm, for once. Yeah, MK4 is the first game where they started doing multiple canon ending. Because before this, like in MK1, 2, and 3, the only guy whose ending could really be trusted to be canon was Liu Kang's. Everybody else, if there was backstory stuff in their ending, it was canon, but their ending mostly said, this is what would happen if this guy beat Shao Kahn. So you couldn't trust any of that. You just discount the he beat Shao Kahn part, and you take the rest for what it is. Yeah. Usually. But MK4 is the first time where multiple endings in the same game are completely canon. You have here Quan Chi kind of punking them both and gloating over how he's managed to... He's basically yeah. been, been playing both of them since Mythologies. Yeah. And he opens up his trap it's about like... it and gloats and thank you for beating him for me. He's not dead, but you've done a good job. Now I'm going to send you back to hell. And so Seems a little premature. Yeah, but... you know, you figure he would have waited. But he doesn't. He's just that eager to start gloating and running his mouth. Yeah, like, Kwai Liang's not even unconscious. He's just lying on the ground hurt. He's like, I'll take it from here. By the way, I killed your clan. Ha ha, fuck off. <laughs> and... This is one of those things that Nine would eventually fill in the blanks. When he did it, he did it disguised as Bihan. Well, or quite I don't know if even that is true. I'm not he sure. might have just been showing a fake uh, vision. Like, all, that animated section that he shows Scorpion could have been a complete illusion. It's possible. Because in that vision, there's a whole horde of Lin Kuei riding horses. And I don't think Quan Chi can make himself into a whole bunch of people. <laughs> ah, but fellow demons, perhaps. Maybe. I mean, he does have a whole Brotherhood of the Shadow at his disposal. I have to imagine Quan Chi, being as powerful a sorcerer as he is, could destroy a village all on his own. Possible. Especially if he's just setting it on fire, mostly. But would he rather set it on fire himself, or would he rather laugh as people do it for him? Yeah, that's fair. But the point is, 
he opens his yap too soon. Yeah, Quan Chi pulls the classic bad writing in a Mortal Kombat game move and admits what he did. <laughs> Nobody even asked. He just volunteers yeah. the information. <laughs> so he starts teleporting him back, and Scorpion looks down at himself and goes, Nope, this is not happening again. I'm nope. not going down Scorpion alone. Scorpion is so angry that he can resist the teleport long enough to run at Quan Chi and grab at him so that they're both teleported. Congratulations, Quan Chi. You played yourself. Mm -hmm. And they both end up down in the Nether Realm in specifically Scorpion's Lair stage from Ultimate. And Quan Chi's reaction to this, to being in his own home realm, is to scream, No! I mean, maybe these spells come with a certain period of time banishment? It's, well, it makes more sense in Deadly Alliance, where we find out that certain regions of the Nether Realm drain magic and are bad for sorcerers. And the fifth plane of the Nether Realm, Scorpion's Lair, in particular, is one of those places. Not only does it make Quan Chi weaker to be there, it makes Scorpion stronger. Because it fuels his Hellfire powers and his rage. Which means that every time Quan Chi's had to speak with Scorpion, he's had to basically maybe open a portal in the Nether Realm to that other realm and kind of go, yo, come through. I can't talk to you in there. You gotta come out here. I like to imagine that he's done most of his interacting with Scorpion through messengers and that that messenger is Noob Saibot. <laughs> because I, I love the idea of Noob talking to him and him not knowing who Noob is and Noob just being like, this is so much fun I I kind of feel that's a bit petty for Noob Dude, Quan Chi would do it, if but... If anybody is petty, <laughs> it's gonna be Noob Saibot I mean, it's a nice thought, but it seems a bit more involved I think that that's just us wanting Noob and Scorpion to finally have a reunion of sorts Yeah, I yeah. Get it. See, see, that's 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 a thing that bothered me. Noob Saibot and Scorpion have never canonically met in any of the games. And that's fucking weird. The opportunity <laughs> has just not really shown up, I guess. Or it has, but they always have other things for Noob to do. Yeah, it just seems like a really glaring oversight. Eleven might be the game for that, I think. Because I, I don't hope. think that we're going to get, like the nether realm smoke hybrid demon thing going on again yeah well i just at the very least we'll get the you know versus intros i hope they're good in this one because injustice 2 was a disappointment in that area but yeah quan chi spends the next what is it a decade 12 years being slapped well, around so there's there's some weird things about the timeline so the only games that we have for sure dates of are MK1 is 1992, which means Mythologies was 1990, and Deadly Alliance is specifically 10 years after the first tournament, so it's 2002. There is a line somewhere, and I cannot trace this, I can't find where I saw it, but I know I did at one point in time, that said MK4 was 10 years after Mythologies, which would mean... MK4 is the year 2000, and so Scorpion and Quan Chi are down there for only two years. Hmm. That entire timeline period is just wonky. I could have sworn yeah, it was... Yeah, apparently there was a 10. huge gap... Apparently there was a huge gap between MK3 and MK4, and a much smaller gap between 4 and Deadly Alliance, which is the opposite of how it happened in the real world, where... MK1, 2, 3, and 4 are all released back-to-back, -back, and then we had to wait years before Deadly Alliance came out. Yes, I remember taking quite some time and pitching fits and thinking that my favorite series was dead. Yeah, yeah, it was a prevailing, prevailing thought until Deadly Alliance was first revealed that maybe the MK series was just over. But here we are. Better than yeah. ever. So, Quan Chi is trapped in the Nether Realm in a particular part of the nether realm that drains his sorcery and makes scorpion stronger for 2 years and scorpion is just chasing him and wailing on him and then he manages to get away and he finds him again and it's just this cat and mouse for 2 years where scorpion's trying to just m torture the guy 
I still prefer the idea of 10 years, because it just seems so much more thematically appropriate. And I always hated that bald prick. But <laughs> yeah. two years is, I guess, nothing to sniff at either. I mean, if it were, if it's too long a period of time, it starts to be like, why doesn't he just kill him? Yeah. And there there are there are logical answers to that that I could come up with like well Quan Chi's a demon he just respawn if he dies. But then he kills him in MKX and everybody seems to think that that's dead. So, I there don't has know. to be a difference. There's there's living in the nether realm and there's being tormented as a specter or well, a ghost. We or have, have a specific you. example of what happens if you die. And you're already in the nether realm. Like if you're a demon or an undead. And it's Serena. She dies in mythologies. And all it does is take away her human form. Reveal her true demon self. And it traps her in the prison. In the fifth uh, plane. And she becomes just like any of the, the dead people. Who are trapped in hell. Who are tortured by the demons. So basically de-leveled to nothing. Basically. I imagine for Quan Chi, who's spent thousands, maybe millions of years evolving from a demon into a guy who looks kind of human and building up all the sorcery power, to start up, to start back at level one would be a big problem for him. <laughs> Naturally. So we know that Quan, our favorite Des Ball faced bastard, manages to evade Scorpion at points for long enough. That he stumbles on, you know, the portals and the... Well, what... He finds... First he finds Draman and yeah. Moloch. And Draman is the guy in charge of all the torture in hell. He is the Oni Tormentor. He is the boss of torturing dead people and their souls and shit. And he's down in the fifth plane doing his job. And Quan Chi is like, hey, I'll cut you deal. I'll get you and the big guy out of here if you get this scorpion motherfucker off my back. <laughs> and help me find a way to escape. And so Drama and Moloch are like, you know what? I think we might have something for you. And they show him this thing called the Rune Stone, which is a slab of rock hidden in the nether realm. Somebody put it there to keep it out of people's hands. A lot of a lot of magic items are actually hidden in the nether realm to keep them away from people. This particular slab of rock, the Rune Stone, is an instruction booklet for Shinnok's amulet. I don't know why this exists, but there it is. This helps Quan Chi because he happens to have Shinnok's amulet at this time. He's actually had it on his person since mythologies and has been keeping that fact a secret. When you're having your ass handed to you for a couple of years, you know, you clutch onto something. You keep hope alive. And to give Quan credit, I guess... He was always hopeful he'd find a way out, and to keep using that power. Mm -hmm. So Quan Chi reads the Rune Stone and figures out. Well, actually, this is this is where he gets his tattoos because since Scorpion is chasing him, he's in a hurry. He can't stop and read everything on this rock, so he actually burns it all onto his skin. The guy's hardcore. Yeah, and and this is why the fact that he has the tattoos in the new timeline is a big weird continuity error because MK9 is obviously way before Deadly Alliance. He shouldn't have tattoos yet. He shouldn't have the amulet on his belt yet, but that costume is reused assets, so whatever. <laughs> uh, so anyway, Quan Chi burns all the writing from the rune stone onto his arms and head and back. And stays on the run. And, you know, he's reading these instructions. And he's like, oh, the amulet controls a bunch of portals. I can get out of here that way. Let me find one of these portals. And these portals are kind of hard to miss. They're shaped like giant versions of the amulet. <laughs> Everything can be a MacGuffin if you just squint. <laughs> I really, really did prefer it so much when portals were a thing. A big thing. A thing you had to work hard to open and create, and there were rules and regulations. Now you just turn over a rock and you find one. Well, there is, there is. To think, be fair, I don't think the devaluing of the concept of the portal started here. I no. think it was years and years ago. There is backup to this because that's the entire reason that the OIA exists. Is that there? Yeah. 
specifically supposed to go and find portals and take them out. And and honestly, that particular plot thread is actually inspired by the cartoon Defenders of the Realm. <laughs> God, help the idea us all. that there are portals all over Earth Realm, just randomly occurring in nature, is actually a creation of John Tobias from the very beginning. That was that used to be the reason why everyone wanted Earth Realm so bad. <laughs> it had a lot of portals in nature. It was in effect a nexus. Yes, you could you could get to anywhere from Earth Realm. So if you controlled Earth Realm, you could invade the rest of the universe. It's basically Midgard on the world tree. But back to Scorpion. Right. So so Scorpion is chasing Quan Chi and now he has to deal with these two dumb demons. And Quan Chi dives through one of these amulet portals and ends up in Outworld. And Moloch and Dromin are like, wait, he's leaving us behind! He's betraying us! And they chase him through the portal too. And then Scorpion chases them all through the portal. And Yakety Sack starts playing. And off-screen Serena has somehow broken free and she goes through the portal too. <laughs> but she's neither here nor there for the time being. Right. Everybody who goes through the portal ends up in a different location... Because it's it's kind of on random shuffle mode, this portal, and you can see that in the uh, the Deadly Alliance, the opening cutscene. <laughs> so Quan Chi ends up in Onaga's tomb. Moloch and Draman end up in some random village out in the w wilderness. Scorpion ends up in some other part of the wilderness, and Serena ends up in another part of the wilderness. <laughs> they're all just they're all just dumped into random places in Outworld. To be, I mean, to be really fair about this, this is acceptable because this is kind of a trope, and it's the it's one of the reasons Chrono Trigger starts the way it does. <laughs> People who jump through portals after someone else don't end up directly where the other person ended up in that specific time and place. If they did, stories would be a hell of a lot more boring. So just roll mm. with it. Right. but But at this point... Scorpion has gotten pretty good at hunting people who he's supposed to get his revenge on. And so he tracks Quan Chi, and he finds him at Shang Tsung's house, because Quan Chi is forming the Deadly Alliance. Shang Tsung has gone inside the house to get something, and Quan Chi's just standing out in the backyard, which is that acid bath stage with the spitting Buddhas. Please wait here, and I will be back with you shortly. Enjoy the music <laughs> that plays in my courtyard. <laughs> yeah. Can't come in? No. To be fair, Shang wouldn't want Quan Chi in his house. Right, right. So, so Scorpion jumps Quan Chi while he's standing there in the backyard. And they have a fight. And it's interesting, most of this th fight doesn't appear in the game, but it was 3D animated. Because pieces of it are used for the commercials for Deadly Alliance. And for the music video for Adima's Immortal. Sorry, just not a fan of that song. So it's weird that they went to all the trouble of animating this shit and then didn't put the full version anywhere in the game. Again, every game they make, they can't include everything that they want to do. They've been on record as saying this multiple times. I suppose. But anyway, at this point, Quan Chi has gotten some of his strength back from not being trapped in the fifth plane of the Nether Realm, and is able to beat Scorpion and knock him into the acid. Scorpion dies, and immediately respawns in the Nether Realm, and comes back to Outworld to try again. And meanwhile, Shang Tsung walks out of the house, and he's like, what the fuck just happened? And Quan Chi plays it real cool, he's like, that was an assassin come to kill you! I have defeated him for you! Because we're friends, right? <laughs> oh my god. See, this is... <laughs> Shit like this is why I try not to stare too long and too hard at specific pieces of canon. Because if you do that, everyone's an idiot. For the most part, I'm happy... I like that. I don't know. I'm, I'm happy looking at the bigger picture, the most important details. I don't need every fight to have a canonical reason. Otherwise, it's, it's mean, stupid shit like Johnny and Jack's fighting in the Armory in 9 because of a slight like misunderstanding. Uh, I like that scene. Johnny and Jax would totally fight eventually if they met for the first time. You can't justify every every single fight without things becoming a little bit dumb, is my point. I, I like it. I like it. Okay. I think it's funny. I suppose. 
I just like to give Shang a bit more credit for his brains. It's, like it's not like Shang starts trusting him. You know what? They're still like side eyeing each other for the entire game. <laughs> I'll read it like this. I just beat that assassin for you, bro. Uh huh. That's how I'm gonna read that scene. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Anything that makes Shang coming look better coming out of the Deadly Alliance than he actually does. So Quan and Shang go off to conquer Li Mei's village and build their castle and create the Soul NATO. They have a lot of the crazy misadventures. Shang makes yeah. an alliance with Draman and Moloch and periodically feeds them people because Yeah, you know, keep keeps them in his basement for the day that he's ready to turn on Quan Chi. There is backup plan. Because they're side eyeing each other the entire game. <laughs> So Scorpion tracks them to their new castle, Shang Tsung's palace, and he sneaks in. And he makes the mistake of sneaking into the basement, where Moloch and Draman are. They can't eat him. This is important. They actually can't eat him. They wouldn't derive yes, any nourishment from his flesh. Right. There is, as a dead guy, his meat is useless. <laughs> Not... A part of the food pyramid. So they decide to throw him into Shang's Soul Nato. And the reason this is important is because the way this Soul Nato works is it's actually just an open portal that leads to heaven. And all the dead people in heaven are flying out and making a big tornado of souls. Reminder at this point the Elder Gods don't give a shit unless you're trying to merge the realms. Right, still so just them. having holes open in heaven doesn't bother them. <laughs> That's it. Really, that is it. So, so Moloch and Draman decide to throw Scorpion in, because he's a hell spawn. So if you chuck, chuck him into heaven, he'll just be fucking obliterated. Right. This might actually kill his soul. I'm guessing it was Draman who came up with that one, so good chops. I like it. The logic is sound, but for those of you keeping track, that is Scorpion's MK Deadly Alliance plot in a nutshell. Yes. Chases Quan Chi out of hell, gets knocked back in, comes back out, chases Quan Chi again, gets thrown into the Soul Nato. That's all he does. Yeah. So Scorpion is thrown in the Soul Nato, and he's going to be carried to heaven, which will destroy him, maybe forever. And he manages to slip out but he slips out at a point between dimensions and ends up in the void the empty space between realms which is where the elder gods actually live they don't live in heaven so so when he ends up in the void in front of the elder gods uh at the same time onaga happens to be coming back in outworld and the elder gods are worried about it because if onaga does what he set out to do He'll bring back the one being, which is the one thing they actually care about. Yep. Onaga is being subtly, subconsciously influenced by the one being at this point, I think. Now, for, for the purposes of Scorpion's story and motivation, it's also worth mentioning that at this point in time, Quan Chi is dying. Raiden has blown himself, Quan, and Shang up. Shang Quan is actually dead right now. And that's canon. Like, you'll, you'll sometimes hear people who think Quan Chi made a portal and ran away because th he started to run in the cutscene. That's not what happens. That's an old rumor. He did not succeed in portaling away. He is blown up. And we know he's blown up because there are bios in Armageddon that say so. Scorpion is in the void with the Elder Gods, and they're like, well, this guy's here right now, and we don't have a champion of the Elder Gods right now. Congratulations on your new job, bro. Go kill Onaga. <laughs> and for the first time in a decade plus of storytelling, Scorpion was not motivated by revenge. And I no, was he's, I was he's so just happy. He's a genuine good guy in, in Deception. I was so fucking happy when this happened because I'd become entirely sick of the character by that point. Yeah, I still, like, I like what happens to him in X, but I still think Champion of the Elder Gods is the best Scorpion. It's a shame that they never did anything with it. Yeah. Well, I'll get to that uh, when we get to Armageddon. I have some thoughts, but anyway, for now. Quickly, about about Quan Chi and uh, 
He was blown up. They specify that in Shang's Armageddon bio. But yeah. there was a lot of back and forth about that at the time because you kind of see him slipping out of visibility yeah, like during the deception Yeah, like, in the intro. opening cutscene, in the opening cutscene, as Raiden is going to blow himself up, Quan Chi turns and starts to run away. But he doesn't so really make it. So people thought maybe he escaped. And that maybe, over years of internet, somehow became people actually believing he did. But it is not the case. No, he, he's blown the fuck up. He is dead in Deception. He comes back to life in Armageddon. Shinnok does that. But during Deception, Quan Chi is dead. And the reason I want to bring that up in relation to Scorpion is because I have a thought about the nature of Scorpion's powers and his life as a specter. Because going back to what we said before with the uh, original arcade era, Scorpion believed that if he got his revenge, he could, quote-unquote, rest in peace. And I've always took that to mean he would, like, lose his powers and not be a specter anymore, and maybe he would just become another soul in the nether realm. Maybe he would actually earn his way to heaven. I'm not sure what the intention was, but I always believed that if he finished his mission, Scorpion would be done as a character. So the fact that... Quan Chi's death coincides with him getting a new set of powers, I think is worth noticing. That's entirely fair. So if if he ha if Quan Chi is gone, if his revenge is over, the fact that he's the champion of the Elder Gods now is something that's keeping him in the series. I'll still point out that's conjecture, but it's informed conjecture. And I don't right. disagree. And obviously none of this matters to the new timeline. Where he's actually I'm alive. just throwing it out there. No. It's, it's a good point of view. It's a good angle. So, so Scorpion goes out to do his new job, and we don't know exactly what he actually does. In his own ending, he waits in the Nexus for Onaga to be traveling between realms, and he's going to jump him there and kill him. And maybe he does have the power to kill him. But we know that's not canonically how Onaga dies, so obviously that doesn't happen. What does happen is that uh, Shujinko gathers pretty much the entire cast of the game together, which probably includes Scorpion. He copies all of their powers at once to become, you know, the most overwhelmingly broken character in the history of the franchise. And then he destroys the Kami Dogus so that Onaga will not be invincible anymore. And then as he's beating Onaga to death, Nightwolf sucks Onaga's soul out of Reptile and traps it in the Netherrealm. Which leaves Scorpion kind of SOL. To be fair... Scorpion did participate in Onaga's defeat if he was one of the guys who lent Shujinko his power. He was around. He was involved, theoretically. Which takes us to Armageddon, where the Elder Gods quote-unquote reward Scorpion for doing his job by resurrecting the Shirai Ryu clan. This is something that you see in Conquest. Yes. They resurrect them as Hellspawn. Yes, they have specter powers, and and this bothers Scorpion for some reason. He wanted them, I guess, to be alive alive. Now, if I remember right, the wording of this made it so that they were pissed off that he was making demands of them. Well, I don't I don't think I don't think it's said one way or the other that the Elder Gods did this on purpose to get at him for or anything. Like the way, the only thing we really see in Armageddon is him saying, I did my job, and they offered me this reward. The problem is, they're undead, and that's not what I wanted, and that pisses me off. It doesn't say that the Elder Gods, like, for all we know, they made them undead because they thought that was a good thing. I mean, these guys have superpowers now. Possible. Is Scorpion's life technically different in a better or worse way as a specter than it would be as living Hanzo. No, I'm gonna have to go back to I'm gonna have to go back to Armageddon and replay the conquest mode because I feel certain that he was incredibly pissed off at the Elder Gods during conquest. Oh, he he was super pissed off. Scorpion is actually like to the point of being out of character. He's decided when he when you meet him in in conquest when he fights Taven, he says he's decided that since the Elder Gods have done this that he didn't want or didn't like the results 
He's so mad at them that he's going to actually stop Taven. He wants Armageddon to happen. He wants the universe to be destroyed to get back at the Elder Gods. That's what happens when you try to justify every single fight. It's a mistake. Which is the most insane villain thing. Like, even the bad guys in Armageddon don't want the universe to be destroyed. They just want to win. So Armageddon Scorpion is just the worst. Just... The writing has gone completely off the rails. We knew that. Mistakes were made. But I do feel like his level of anger is justifiable if he feels the Elder Gods have punked him. Which he almost I certainly guess. does. I mean, okay, so so there is there there are a few th points I wanna I wanna make about this whole I want you to resurrect my clan request. And actually on reflection, seeing the Shira Ryu here as resur as resurrected hell spawn might have been what caused me to realize that Ultimate MK3's multi-scorpions were the Shirai Ryu. I can see that. Possible. But, so here's the thing. First of all... Tell us about the thing, Razor. <laughs> we need a t-shirt that says, here's the thing. <laughs> Continue. So Scorpion's original goal, in theory was to, quote-unquote, rest in peace. To be with his family again in heaven, I guess? That's what I've always interpreted as. So in Armageddon and in MK9, Scorpion's goal is suddenly to have them resurrected. And my thinking here is, how is that better than heaven? Because let's be clear, Scorpion's wife and son are not among the hell spawn. They did not come back. And you know why? Because the Shirai Ryu, the ninjas, they went to hell when they died. Harumi and Satoshi, and that is their real names, not Kana and Jubei, <laughs> they went to heaven when they died because they were innocent. And this is where I bring up the notion of Armageddon endings being a little bit sloppily written. But if you want right. to take this as the as evidence of them fucking with Scorpion, well, you could consider this because his his Armageddon ending does say that the Shuryu are resurrected in the thousands, and that his wife and son are among them. So if well, this anything... is after he gets Blaze's prize, though. Yes, but again, I know that a lot of Armageddon endings are written like shit. See Planet Smoke. I don't have to say anything more, <laughs> but. That old tradition. You take things that you learn and you apply it to what is. And I could see Scorpion being pissed off enough if his wife and son were reborn as Hellspawn to want to fuck with the Elder Gods any way he could. You, you have to finish the ending. He wishes for his family back, but then Quan Chi runs up to the pyramid and grabs his son and whoop, 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 whoops away. And that's the point that we discard. But we have, <laughs> but we have learned. What we have learned is that they were brought back. This That's whole the key. this whole stupid ending, though, is just so Quan Chi can be a motherfucker. Not impossible. And like, so it's... the cycle of Scorpion chasing his enemy in every goddamn game, instead of getting something new to do, continues unabated. You've got to admit, if there was any ending that they put some kind of thought into. It might have been this one. I, no, there are a couple endings that I think are legitimately useful in Armageddon. This is not one of them. I will take that, that mention of the wife and son. They don't bring it up in Conquest directly, but I could see why he would be angry. I just, I just have a problem from the morality of it for Scorpion to even ask for this. Because it's not, would you rather be alive or would you rather be in heaven? You're asking the wrong guy here, I'd rather be in here, fucking man. heaven. You're asking the wrong guy. <laughs> All right. Well, let's imagine imagine that we lived in a universe where we knew for sure there was a heaven. <laughs> I don't know. I would rather be in fucking heaven. Seems kind of. I don't dull. want my husband to be like, you know what? I want you back, and then yank me out of eternal paradise. See, that's not her husband, though. That's the elder gods as punishment for him yeah, fucking but with them. Yeah, that's Scorpion for this. this. He requested this reward. You don't ask, and he does it again in 9! You don't ask the Elder Gods for shit. They're assholes! They don't care! 
You're not there. No, actually, what happens in nine is that Raiden offers it to Scorpion, which means Raiden is the asshole who thinks it's better to be on Earth than in Heaven. Seems about par with MK9's characterization of Raiden. Sure, why not? Ah, <sighs> god damn it. Sorry, man. It just the, just, the Elder I don't, Gods. I don't agree with any of this. The Elder the Gods ideal use Scorpion people. Should be a guy who wants to die and rest in peace in heaven, not a guy who wants to yank people out of the afterlife to be with him on Earth. Can he rest in peace if he knows his family and clan are suffering? I don't know if he can. But his wife and kid are not suffering. If they're hellspawn, they are. I I don't you're necessarily basing the whole thing off that ending though. Hey. Okay? If they're hellspawn, then why aren't they there fighting Taven? <laughs> Maybe they can't fight. Maybe they've just been brought back as a cruel joke because the Elder Gods are You know pricks. what? None of those guys could fight, and I had to beat them up anyway. <laughs> Splitting hairs. Those minions yeah. die in one hit. <laughs> They're not going to let you beat up a Hellspawn child. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, Scorpion's kid was, what, like eight years old? Exactly. <laughs> I'm just saying. There's justification for him being angry as he is. If... His wife and son are also Hellspawn at this time. That's how I took it anyway. But it's not that it actually matters, because as we all know, Pyramid, Blaze, everyone says, ooh, a shiny thing, and runs to it, and then there are no friends, and Scorpion's canonical story in the original timeline ends with Sub-Zero's sword in his back. Yeah. You see this in I the guess. you see this in the nine opening. I mean the thing of it is that Anybody who dies can just come back. So I don't know why we're supposed to be upset about Armageddon. Especially Scorpion. Yeah. If Quan Chi's also dead. Like, if, if Sub-Zero put that sword in his back, 15 minutes later, he's back on the battlefield. Honestly. Logically. I mean, we now have evidence that, like, Katana might not have been dead, or there's a world where Katana was not... Or well, Katana that's, that's dead. the weird thing. Like, you see Katana's body in the opening cutscene of Nine... But then her ending in X said, actually, you weren't going to die. You would have survived Armageddon. Mm. So so how much of that fucking opening cutscene can we really take seriously? I think we're supposed to assume most people died. I mean, the other, the other thing is everybody's wearing the wrong goddamn costume. They play it fast and loose with costumes all the time. I tend to not look at costumes as direct canon. Although they seem to be slowly retconning it so that Scorpion's ultimate MK3 outfit is his default and always has been. Well, he wears it in Deception as an alternate and then in Armageddon yeah, as like, a primary. It's, it's his Deception alternate, it's his Armageddon primary. He had it in Mythologies when he was in Hell. If not for the fact that they just do enjoy redesigning characters every single time a game comes around. If they were trying to do an absolutely 100% accurate story version of MK1, no frills attached, I feel like he'd be wearing the Ultimate MK3 outfit from the beginning. I, I don't think so. I think I think he'd be wearing something a little more baggy ninja. I think the reason that he has it on in mythology. We forgot to bring up a very, very important point. What's that? Well, I don't know about important, but a little side note about canonicity that's been dropped over time. What it said in the MK1 manuals was that Scorpion's clan wore yellow, ah, assumedly yes. to mock the Lin Kuei as yes, cowards. Yes, they deliberately chose the color yellow because it's the color of cowards. Yes. They are wearing Lin Kuei uniforms colored yellow. And that's why they're palette swaps. Damn straight. Here there was a reason. And... <laughs> we, forgot, we forgot to bring that little point up, but... Yeah, this is uh this is important going. F it's not important going forward, but it was an important yeah, detail I mean, at the in, time. In the age where characters are deliberately made to look as different as possible because, like, Ed is embarrassed about the palette swap jokes. I I imagine that piece of lore is gone now. Probably, because like in a in a perfect world where the costumes made sense. At the very least, Katana and Melina would be dressed very much the same in MK2. Because they are twin sisters. That's on purpose. You're supposed to be able to mistake them for one another. Yes. But but in the world that we live in now, they would never do that in a game. Yeah. Because they are afraid of the stigma 
of being the game that palette swaps were from. Well, when you have a community that's asked you for Chrome in 2018, can you blame them? The damage mm. is done. But there is there is a thing I wanted to say about, I think the reason that Scorpion is wearing the ultimate costume in Mythologies is specifically because they reused Ultimate MK3 sprites for that boss fight. Because those sprites are the ones that do combos and have the axe. So they were like, well, we can reuse these assets. And then when we film the cutscene, we need to have him wearing that costume to match it. Now, I get the logic and the reasoning. I just, I tend to think it's a bit more involved than that. Like, well, because cause if you... They bring it back time after time after time. It's clearly their favorite look for the guy. I think so. I mean, you're not wrong about that. I just, I don't think he'd be wearing it in a remake of MK1. I mean, I think that they do it because I think that that's the way they want him to look now. I mean, ideally, in my mind now, when I think of classic era versions of the outfits, when it comes to Bihan, I think of the Mythologies outfit. When it comes to Scorpion, I think of the basic Ultimate MK3 palette, or like well, the blocks. Because the thing of it is, like, his costumes in 9 are not based on that outfit, and his costume in Versus DC is based more on his MK2 look. So I think it's more like Scorpion has uh, two iconic looks from the arcade era. You either get MK2 Scorpion, or you get MK3 Scorpion. It just seems to me that the ultimate MK3 look is kind of predominant. But, I mean, it figured so prominently in the MK11 opening. Well, the, the MK3, the ultimate outfits weren't even in MK9 except in the Vita version. That, to me, felt like a really, really poor choice. I always wondered why they did that. I, I think... Again, I think if they were to do just, like, a straight remake, like, a, something true to the original timeline of MK1, I think he would have a more MK1 and 2 inspired, like, the quilted outfit. And then I think, I think he would definitely wear his MK3 costume when they got to MK3. I think it's like, there's a tournament outfit and there's a hell outfit. So you like the ultimate MK3 as being his basic hell outfit, then? Yeah. Alright, that's not an unfair assumption to make. They just seem to be in love with the damn thing. Not that I dislike it. I've, I've become used to it. I initially kind of hated it, actually. Well, I think the, uh, the, if you play it straight out of M Ultimate, where he's got, like, the yellow ass. I don't like that. But, like, the MK4 version, the MK4 version and the, uh, Ultimate, or the, uh, the Deception alternate, and the Shaolin Monks version, those, those are all perfectly fine. And I think especially like in, in Deception and Shaolin Monks, where the squares are more like blocks of golden armor. Yeah. I think that's how it works best. No, I'm in agreement. It bothered me for a very long time looking at the Ultimate MK3 spear-throwing sprite because maybe got back. <laughs> I mean, like, it made his ass look big. It really did. Yeah. And it was a wise decision to kind of tone that down over time it's such a weird design because i know i know with mk3 tobias was borrowing really really heavily from comic books and it does look more superhero i guess but it's like it's not a good superhero app. it's not like a timeless iconic thing like spider-man it's more like one of the 90s x-men it feels like a uniform, which is why I'm more generally comfortable with, like, Rain and Ermac and people who work yeah. for Khan wearing it. Yeah, it's, that's It's thing. become like, an iconic look for Scorpion, but it isn't... It's not my favorite. Yeah, like, it is, it is weird that it's become associated most with Scorpion, because story-wise, all of the ninjas in Ultimate MK3 are working for Shao Kahn. So if you said that was the uniform of his, like, Hitman squad, it would make sense. And the fact that Scorpion just kept wearing it after that seems more like he got lazy and stopped changing his clothes, rather than that it belongs <laughs> to him. Because it feels like a Shao Kahn uniform to me. Maybe it was a uniform that Kahn gave him initially. Because remember, listeners, at this time, human smoke is not canon. And Classic Sub-Zero is not a thing, really. Yeah. 
So the the ninjas running around in UMK3 are Ermac, works for Khan, Reptile, works for Khan, Noob Cybot, works for Shinnok while working for Khan, Rain, works for Khan. There's really not a single one. All the ninjas yeah, no, are running around like working for Khan and Sub Zero is single unmasked. one of them. Yeah. Every single one of them that's canon works for Khan, yeah. And so I always thought of it as a uniform. Me too. Also, Chameleon. If you care about that kind of thing. If if he is thought of to have a story at all, it's that he works for Khan. <laughs> he was always there. From the beginning. He right. There right but, now. but when you fight him, it says a warrior of Shao Khan's or something like that. And that's all he... Yeah, that's it. That's all, that's all he gets. That's the, literally that one sentence is the only story he has. And it justifies our point. <laughs> Whatever he is doesn't matter. It's what he's wearing that counts. And he's working for Khan. Yep. Yep. So that, that little costume tangent we covered a bit. Uh, where were we before that? <laughs> I guess we were talking about Armageddon. Yeah, he did. Right, so the the point that I wanted to make is that even though Scorpion is mad at the Elder Gods, he's still technically their champion. So with some rewrites, you could turn this around and, like... Because I've always been a big proponent that Armageddon didn't have to end the universe. It could have just been another game. They could have defeated, solved the problem, killed off some people, and then made a sequel. I don't think that that would have been impossible. It's just that, you know... I actually think it would have been fairly easy. But this is something that I've been thinking about for, like, ten years... Midway being in Dire Straits and them getting sold and WB picking them up and the formation of NetherRealm Studios now as we know it. I mean, yeah, there's. I understand why they rebooted. I mean, my, my biggest problem is that if you're going to reboot, start from scratch, don't do the whole thing. They wanted to have their cake and eat it too. Yeah, and J.J. Abrams' Star Trek had just come out and they were copying that. But I don't want this to just devolve into like us crapping on MK9 for the mistakes that it made again. We do that plenty. Yeah. This this is though the transition point. We've we've pretty much covered everything that happens to Scorpion in Armageddon. We can bring up a brief footnote about his MK8 DC appearance. Ah, uh, yes. I mean, it's basically the Shaolin monks look. It's with a touch it's of the more skull mask. MK2ish. I like it. I like that outfit. I think I think it's a little over the top. The belt and the boots. The shoulder pads are a bit much. Yeah, yeah. But like, just just the fact that they went back to the quilted look and that mask actually, like the the rib cage on his face style mask. I like that. Yeah, I like it a lot, and I like it specifically because it looks like the mask he's wearing in the live action Mortal Kombat 2 commercial. Correct. I wish that outfit had been his MK9 outfit, because there are elements that seem inspired by it. Like, they continued some themes, like, but they went way over the top with them. Like, the mask has changed from a rib cage on his face to an alien monster hugging his face. The mask itself didn't bother me as much as, like, the overuse of the scorpion motif absolutely everywhere all over him did. It's, it's too much all over the body. Every single element is too much. It's, it's, his MK9 primary is my most hated scorpion outfit of all time. And hate is a strong word. I just say most hated because least favorite has the word favorite in it, and I don't like <laughs> No, honestly, I can't stand it. It's very, it's very insectoid, very creepy crawly, and it just... It's he looks he looks like a Masters of the Universe villain. He looks yeah. like he's gonna fight He Man. It's fucking bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry guys, but no, it, it's also got like the the terrible shoulder pads. It's over designed. It's it's, bad. it's very much over designed. Yeah, but the mask itself, I like in isolation. The motif. I I really don't. I think all the like the little grooves that look like. I don't know, bug pincers or something. I think if if the MK versus DC outfit hadn't existed first for me to compare them and contrast them to each other, the mask wouldn't bother me so much. But because his versus DC mask was so good, 
it makes me even more upset at the MK9 one. I can understand wanting to incorporate the motif of a scorpion on a character whose name is Scorpion. They just went overboard with it. The layers of chitinous exoskeleton like armor that are over his legs. Yeah, the, the fact that all of his, like, the black undersuit yeah. is all, like, layers of bug skin or, like, cancerous growth stuff. It's it's deliberately drawing upon the art style of H.R. Geiger. Everything in moderation. And hey, look at that. We've devolved into shitting on MK9 again. Yeah, well, we are at minutes. MK9 now, so we might as well. There is a tendency in art to depict things from hell as Geiger-esque. And I don't like that. The hell that I want Mortal Kombat's universe to have the hell that we saw in games before MK9 was more based on industrial and heavy metal music. You know, there were belts and spikes. It's a little bit bondagey. That's what I think of when I think of hell. That's what I want to see is like a Frazetta album cover, not the movie Alien. I'm open to different interpretations of it. I believe that the Netherrealm has, you know, it, well, we know it has many planes and many dimensions, and we know that there are places where people are just tormented and tortured. Like, we saw what Draven was put through. Yeah. And I've always wanted to see us take a trip through the various levels of the Netherrealm and see all those different kind of awful hellscapes. One plane looks like Geiger. One plane looks like something out of, like, Lovecraft's, Lovecraft's works. Like the Christian version of hell. I'm okay with that. Just throw if there it all was together. In a like pot. a specific section of hell that was more Geiger esque and had like more insectile stuff, that would be fine. And to have a new character come from there would be fine. But Scorpion, we've seen the plane he comes from, and we've seen his costumes in past games, and he's Spiked Belt's guy. That's what I want for him. That's fair. Just looking at the MK9 versus screen pose, now I want to hang a hat or a coat on his shoulder pad. Yeah, it's those fucking shoulder pads with the ridiculous cartoon scorpions. That's It's too much. That's what I mean when I say he looks like a He-Man villain. It's very themed, overdone. Maybe if for an MK4 costume, where it's like, you know, his character has been progressing and in a more Netherrealm-themed direction... But when he's showing up for the tournament for the first time, he's only been dead a couple years. He should look the most human at that point. There's a lot that I want to say about Scorpion's general design and motif. There's not a lot of thought put into the concept of character development or progression in MK9 because it all because the game itself happens so fast. Like MK1, 2 and 3 were squeezed back-to-back -back two and a half hours of cutscenes, whereas the games take place over months, maybe years. We'll talk about a uh, story in the new timeline next time. There's a lot to delve into. All right, that's going to be it for the night. We are signing off, and next time we will take up a couple of questions, too. Assuming we don't talk about Scorpion in the new timeline for two more hours... It should go slightly faster. Two games in a comic book versus seven games. <laughs> and then there's all the extraneous source material. I don't know, man. Right. We might make it three parts out of this. There's the movie in Malibu. and You know, there's a lot to say about Scorpion for Conquest, but I might want to save that for when we watch Conquest, because he is the pilot episode. Okay, fair enough. All right, folks. See you on part two. Yep. See you then. Shad's note. Post-recording of episode two. <laughs> we totally didn't make it to questions. <laughs> <laughs>